Hi everyone, it's Marianne and welcome to my Wasteless Life. In this video, let's talk about the Cradiscantia Nanook. Thank you so much for joining me today and if you're new, this is my Wasteless Life where I share with you my plant and sustainable lifestyle journey and share with you my tips and tricks along the way. And today we're going to talk about Cradiscantia Nanook, everything you need to know about the plant as well as its care and propagation. So initially I wasn't very into Tradiscantias. If you watch my two underrated plant varieties video, I did talk about the Tradiscantia variety as an underrated plant because I think people snubbed it a little bit because of its unfortunate common name, which I found out is not even the only common name for the Tradiscantia. And I don't know why that one became the popular one, but we could just take a guess. And also because a lot of Tradiscantia varieties weren't well known, but now I think a lot more varieties of Tradiscantia being well known and especially with the introduction of the Tradiscantia Nanook, the Tradiscantia plant has become a lot more popular within the houseplant community and for today's video I'm specifically going to talk about the Tradiscantia Nanook. Tradiscantia plants originated in Central America, Mexico, South America but the Tradiscantia Nanook specifically actually originated in Sefamir, Netherlands. It is a new variety grown by cross-pollinating two seedlings of the Tradiscantia ablepora in Netherlands in 2012 to create a more hardier Tradiscantia with a lot more showier blooms. And if you had a Tradiscantia plant before, let's say the Tradiscantia zebrina, which is the one that's a lot more common in nurseries and garden centers, I did have this Tradiscantia zebrina for a short period of time last year and I do notice that the leaves and the plants fall off very easily and they're not a very hardy plant. But with Tradiscantia nanook, they are cultivated to not just have that beautiful pink variegation but also to be a lot more hardier compared to other Tradiscantia varieties. Other common names for the Tradiscantia nanook includes Fantasy Venice, Spiderwort Plant, or inch plant. So the Tradiscantia nanook and Tradiscantias in general are perennial plants. So if you do decide to plant it outside and if you're in a zone like I am where we do experience winters, this might have the ability to come back next spring. But for most of us, a Tradiscantia nanook will be an indoor house plant and since they are a trailing plant, they would make great hanging plants. When mature, it can go from 3 to 6 inches tall and when it starts to trail, the trails can go from 12 to 24 inches long. And in the early years, the Tradiscantia Nanook was very difficult to find. It could only be found in Europe. But kind of like with the Pylea Peppermodis, when at first it was only available in Europe and it was so affordable in Europe but very expensive in the US, now the Tradiscantia Nanook has made its way to the United States and it's a lot more cheaper to purchase and it's a lot more common in nurseries and garden centers, especially now that it's part of Costa Farms live trends collection as such the prices for the Tradiscantia Nanook has drastically gone down you can get one from between nine dollars to up to thirty dollars i suggest paying no more than that and if you're gonna buy it from the cost of farms live trends collection if you shop it in store it the prices ranges from 16 to 20 dollars and previously the prices of the live trends collections actually around 30 dollars so in some places it might still be 30 dollars but i think they have brought the prices down this year now costa farms actually offer shopping directly from them so if you go to shop.costafarm.com you can sign up on their website to shop their live trends collection but if you do buy it directly from them on their website it does cost $50 including shipping. I've say just wait for it to come to your local supermarkets or garden centers or even nurseries. And for me, I didn't get my Tradiscantia Nanook from the Costa Farms Live Trends collection, even though I did see it in a couple of my lows. And I didn't get it because I don't know what's the case in your area, but for me, whenever there's a Live Trends collection drop in any of my garden centers, well, usually it's the Lowe's Garden Center, the plants don't look really, really good. Like they are kind of struggling. Strugs to funk. That's struggling to function. Strugs to funk. And I did get mine from Ace Hardware in Alexandria, Virginia. And this one is a lot smaller plant. It did cost me $12, but it's a much healthier plant. As you can see, it's already starting to grow up and trail. And the ones that I saw at Lowe's weren't starting to trail yet, and the leaves were kind of like 
not in the best condition they were very soft and everything so they were either underwatered or overwatered which we'll talk about later when it comes to the plant care of the Tradiscantia Nanook so like I said there's many places that you can get the Tradiscantia Nanook now not just through the cost of farms life trans collection but I think that is the most common option for most of us living in the United States but like this plant that I got this one was grown in Canada and it is by Northland Floral and it was imported from there and I got mine at Ace Hardware for $11.99 I did get a cutting of it from a plant swap last year which is this one right over here as you can see this one is a lot more pink variegation than this kind of scant nook that I got but according to the person that I swap it with she also got it from Ace Hardware so the scant nook also looks very similar to another variety of Tradescantia, which is the Tradescantia fluminescence tricolor, which I don't have a big pot of it, but I did get a cutting of it from a plant swap as well, and I'm trying to propagate it, and this is what it looks like. What I do think distinguishes the Danuk from the fluminescence tricolor is that the fluminescence tricolor does have the ability to produce just green leaves or just pink leaves, and the pattern of the green and pink variegation slightly differs. I feel like the Nanook tends to ombre a little bit from green and then it just kind of like thins out to the pink but the Fluminescence tends to have a little bit more solid and more even green to pink variegation if that makes any sense. I'll throw up some pictures up here so you can see a side-by-side -side comparison. So the care for the Tradis Cantian Nanook is very easy. As mentioned earlier, this is a very easy care, hardy plant. So this one doesn't require a lot of care and it's perfect for beginners. As far as lighting requirement, it does require bright indirect light. It might be able to do in a moderate light setting, but the pink variegation might not be as prominent and you'll also start to get some very leggy trails. The legginess of your Tradis Cantia or the space between the nose is usually a result of it not getting a lot of light, so the plant stretches. If you want your Tradiscantia to be a little bit more compact and not have a lot of space in between nose or in between leaves, then make sure you're giving it bright and direct light. And when it comes to watering, water your Tradiscantia Nanook when the top inch or two of the soil feels dry or is dry. Do not let it completely dry out except in the winters, you can let it dry out but do not let it go dry for too long because Tradiscantia plants do like their soil to be evenly moist. And if the soil becomes too dry for too long, that produces browning leaves or browning tips, kind of like with my smaller Tradiscantia. You can see some browning tips over there because it has experienced some underwatering. If you let the soil dry out completely for too long, the leaves at the bottom would dry out and fall off. So if you want to preserve the leaves of your Tradiscantia, make sure you are on top of its watering. Signs of underwatering, as mentioned earlier, includes dried tips and browning leaves. Signs of overwatering would be soft wilting leaves. It might look like it's a plant that's being underwatered, but you can tell it is being overwatered because that leaves would become mushy, almost translucent. And you could also touch the stems and feel it to be very slimy and also start to get mushy. And that's because the plant has started to experience root rot due to overwatering. So to avoid overwatering, you want a well-draining soil mix for your Tradiscantia Nanook and it prefers its soil pH to be between 5.0 to 6.5. Tradiscantia Nanook doesn't need distilled water but if your tap water is more alkaline then I suggest investing in a pH test kit to help you pH down your water and you can check out my video of plant products I recommend for 2021 to help you figure out how to pH your water for your house plants. And when it comes to fertilization, the Tradiscantia Nanook is a very low feeder, kind of like the Pothos. It can probably get away without fertilization, but if you want to fertilize it, fertilize it twice a year, preferably during the growing season at the start of spring and before the end of the growing season, which is around early autumn. And that's pretty much what your Tradiscantia Nanook needs. It doesn't need a lot of fertilization. Just be on top of the watering and the amount of light that you give it. Other things to know about the Tradiscantia Nanook, it is toxic to pets, so if you have cats or dogs or any type of pet, make sure they stay away from the Tradiscantia Nanook. 
or you keep your plant away from them. And you try this Kenkin Anuk, it's not a high humidity plant, but it will definitely love to receive some humidity. So if you do have a humidifier, make sure you put it close to it. Or if you have an indoor greenhouse, it would appreciate the humidity that you can provide for them. And if it has too little humidity, I suspect that it will produce a lot of dried crispy tips on your Tredis Kenkin Anuk. And you kind of don't want that if you love the look of the Tredis Kenkin Anuk. For a plant that came in a much colder region compared to its other Tredis Kenkin counterparts, it loves a temperature between 55 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit or about 13 degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius. And if you wanted to flower, a very healthy Tradescantia would flower during the growing season, which is from spring to autumn. So right now I'm going to show you how to propagate a Tradescantia Nanook. It is very easy. I'm going to show you two ways you can do it and tell you which one is my preferred method. But just to cover my basis here, some plants that are patented, they don't allow propagation. So make sure you read the labels of your plants to see if they allow propagations and do what you will with that information. But the label of the Tradescantian Anuk that I got didn't say anything about prohibiting propagation. So I'm going to show you how to propagate this Tradescantian Anuk. Propagating Tradescantian Anuk is very easy. It's no different than propagating your pothos or propagating a nerf plant or a petonia plant. So first what you need is clean and sharp scissors or pruning shears. And when making cuttings on your Tradescantia, make sure you are cutting below the node. So the node of the plant would be where you can see that line underneath the leaf. So this is the leaf and it's attached to the stem. It doesn't particularly have a pet petiole, but this part is probably is the petiole. And you can see that dark line, kind of like when you take a pregnancy test, that's lying over there. So that is the node and you would want to cut below that. With this one, I'm going to cut below this one since I want to create my Tradescantina Nook to be a little bit more bushy. So I am trying to cut off the trail. So as you can see, when, after I cut it, you can see there's a lot of water inside the stem. So that's why it's important to keep the soil evenly moist because if it's underwater this would shrivel if it's over water this would rot so here's one cutting so i'm making a cutting anywhere the internodes are a little bit long for my liking so that will be the safest place to make those cuttings and to have the least amount of leaf loss so i made all of the cuttings and i was able to get one two three four cuttings out of it for this one i could propagate them as is or I could make more cuttings from it and I think with this one I'm going to cut it a little bit more I just want to make sure that I am cutting it underneath the node and there you go so I have made two more cuttings out of this one for some they would like this to callus first before they stick it in water or stick it into any propagation medium. Again, for the Tradescantian Anuk, when you're making for a healthy plant like the one that I have, I don't think that's necessary. You can stick it right in water or stick it into a propagation medium of your choice. But if you're concerned, do let it callus before you stick it to water or into soil. This one, I did let callus a little bit because I originally had it in Leca. It experienced root rot. So before transferring it to a direct soil propagation, I did let it callus a little bit before I put it in soil and so far it's doing well. So this is what this looks like after I made those cuttings. So personally for me, what would I would do is I would do a direct soil propagation and I would insert all those cuttings in the same pot but just for the purposes of demonstration. In this video, I would put the cuttings in a different pot. A lot of people find direct soil propagation very intimidating, but as I've gained more experience with propagating my plants, I actually do find direct soil propagation to be the easiest and gives me the best results. And for a plant like the Tradescantian Anuk, I think it is the best way to propagate it. But if you are a beginner and you are more comfortable with water propagation, that is also perfectly fine. So I also have here a small glass of water as you can see the water is a little bit blue because i added this to water which is basically a liquid form of the rooting hormone it has the same ingredients as the rooting hormone powder 
but it also contains NPK. So this is what I use to propagate my plants. You can use regular rooting powder if you have it or just use plain old water. I previously did an experiment on water propagations and I did find that filtered water works best when it comes to my water propagations. But like I said, any old water should work well with water propagations. So don't stress too much about it. With water propagations, it's pretty straightforward. You take your cut in and put it directly into water and just make sure the node part is submerged into the water. But as you can see, the leaf over here is also getting submerged in water. So what you can do is also take out that leaf. You just use your finger to pinch it off and so you don't have the leaf part submerged in water because if it is submerged in water, it can contribute to the rotting of the entire propagation and you don't want that. But if you're water propagating it and everything goes well, Within a week or two, you would see significant root growth and once the roots is about two inches or so, you can transfer it to soil or a medium of your choice. But fair warning with my previous experience with that, I did have the Tradescantia Nanook, the one that I got from a plant swap. I originally had it propagating in water. I did transfer it to Leica after it had significant root growth and it suffered root rot. Just keep that in mind when you are propagating from water and transferring it into a different medium. The success rate varies differently. For some people, they don't have any problems, but I did. That's why I do prefer direct soil propagation so I don't have to worry about transplant shock in between mediums when I'm trying to propagate them. So right here, I have a four inch pot with soil. And as you can see, it has lots of perlite in it because you want a well draining soil. And I'm going to wet it a little bit. I prefer my soil already moist when I do propagations instead of watering it after I put in the propagations. You also have to be very careful of getting the water in between the leaves because it will catch water if you water it from the top, which is why personally I prefer bottom watering. Similar with the water propagation, direct soil propagation is very easy. So what I do is I'll just make some hole into the soil and stick in the propagations and that's pretty much it there's nothing much to it and i'll just stick it into the soil and yeah so the learning curve when it comes to direct soil propagation is making sure that the soil is evenly moist and that means it doesn't get dried out but also it's not oversaturated and also keeping the temperature of the soil because for a plant to get triggered to grow roots, it has to be at least 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius. So this one I'll be putting on my heat mat, but if you don't have a heat mat for propagation, just make sure it is in a much warmer area. Took out all the propagations in the water in the other pot and put it all in here so that I can have a bushier plant. And yeah, I'll give you updates on this. So make sure you are subscribed and follow me also on Instagram. I'll be sharing updates of my Tradis Kenyan and Nuke in my Instagram account at my Oasis Live. So make sure you're following me there and also in my Plentiful newsletter monthly video. So if you're not subscribed to my newsletter yet, please do subscribe. The link to subscribe is down in the description. But thank you so much for watching. If you like it, please give me a thumbs up. And if you're new here, I hope you subscribe. I come up with house plants and sustainable lifestyle videos every week. And if you haven't yet, go check out these videos up here until my next one. But until then, I see you, I appreciate you. Take care of yourself and each other and have a plentiful day. Bye.